The Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by BetaShares, serving over 1 million investors across Australia's broadest range of ETFs. After years of record low interest rates, income-seeking investors have been returning to cash and fixed income ETFs, drawn by the attractive returns on offer. Equity income funds have also been generating healthy income streams. BetaShares provides yield-hungry investors with a range of income-focused funds to choose from, including ETFs offering exposure to cash, bonds, hybrids, Australian shares, and international shares. To explore the BetaShares ETF range, visit betashares.com.au and consider if the fund is right for you. I'm also proud to say that this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, including buy, hold, and sell share recommendations, click the link in your podcast player to secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. Hey there, here's a quick note. This podcast contains general financial advice only. That means it's not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So don't act on the information until you've spoken with your financial advisor. You'll find our full disclosure, disclaimer, and link to our financial services guide in the show notes. In this discussion, I chat with Glenn James, the founder of the My Millennial Money Network, one of Australia's biggest podcasting, social media, and financial literacy networks. Glenn's journey to finance is very particular and very interesting. We cover that in about the first five to 10 minutes of the show, having gone from a tradesperson to a financial advisor and then on to uh, starting his own podcast network. It's a fascinating journey. Throughout this conversation, we talked a lot about content creation, the past, present and future of media and how podcasts are created, where we might be in the podcasting life cycle, how to create great content and thrive in this environment, how to fail fast. But we also talk about really deep topics like mental health and depression and how that impacts personal finance and savings and investing. We share a lot of anecdotes from our own lives and we go back and forth on where we stand on things like budgeting and concepts that oftentimes we take for granted. It was my pleasure to have Glenn in our studio in Melbourne and we recorded this in video. So if you are interested, please check the video on the Rask Australia YouTube channel where we publish a lot of video content and we introduce things that you might not hear or see on the audio version of the podcast. I really hope you enjoy this episode featuring Glenn James, the founder of My Millennial Money. Glenn, welcome to the podcast, mate. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here in Melbourne and taking some time out. I know you've got a busy schedule. It's always time for you. <laughs> <laughs> Too generous. We just went to the, to lunch, which was lovely. And thanks for that. Appreciate it. Um, today, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about your journey. We're going to talk about the business you've created. We're going to talk about media. Hopefully, one thing I want to talk about is like mental health and money. Mm. Uh, we'll talk about investing and all sorts of stuff. So it's kind of like a go anywhere. Yeah. Um, most people that listen to this would know of you or know of the business that you've created. Um, probably, maybe even read your book. Can you tell us a little bit about where your journey to finance, money, investing, business, like where it was seeded? What's the origin story of Glenn James? Well, I, yeah, I'll I'll cut it short. You know how they say, I'll cut a long story short. It's like, then it's a, not a short story. But to be long story short, legit, I uh, did a trade when I left school. Did you really? Yeah. And then telecommunications. And I always knew I wanted to do personal finance. And then- uh, so I left school early, year eleven, and I then did my apprenticeship. Decided I didn't want to be a tradesperson because I always knew, as a, a teenager, that you can only cap out your earning potential if you're on the tools of doing a manual job yeah. because it's eight hours in a day or whatever. Um, so from a young age in my teens, I always understood scale. Um, so then I'm like, well, I can't work with my body. I need to work with my mind and always had an interest in personal finance and investing. Hmm. So then I um, enrolled in a diploma of financial services, financial advice, mm-hmm. um, did that without a job in the industry, quit my trade and studied 
um, correspondence and then got a job entry level in a financial advice office in North Sydney and basically did that for four and a half, five years, so like another apprenticeship, if you will. Mm. Uh, and then I started my own financial advice business when I was 25 and, yeah, did that for 10 years uh, and then- that's just before the end of that business, I wanted to start the podcast um, because I wanted to do one-to-many because mm-hmm. um, I always wanted to do an onla- online business. Yeah. And I spent lots of money, tried to do it in a couple of ways and it didn't work. So, then I started a podcast. So, the first podcast I did actually didn't work. So, I deleted it. Oh. Uh, it was called Sort Your Money Out, the podcast. Oh, yeah. okay. And at the time- Podcasts were um, pretty well. They they've been around for a long time, but when I started sort your money out in like 2016, I'm like, oh, and you know, it's the irony is we're doing it now, but I'm just like, one on one interviews, like they're boring. Like mm. I need to do something different, so I ditched that, and that's when I started my millennial money. I had myself, John, and then Erin at the time, who was a lawyer, not in finance. So, she was like the listener advocate. Yep. So, I kind of just modeled it on the breakfast radio type model, which has been around forever. And that took off um, where Sort Your Money Out didn't because it was just like boring money interviews, right? So, yeah. And then I, when I started My Millennial Money, I said to John and Aaron, I'm like, we need to do this every week for 12, 12 months. Yep. Like it, whatever, if it's going good, if it's going bad, and then we make the call in 12 months because- you know, is this on, this is on the investor podcast, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, if you're like invest, I think one of the best investments you can make is in your own business if you are wired that way. But mm-hmm. you need to actually, you don't want to end up like the Hollywood actor who's 55, still working part-time trying to get the big break because yep. you've wasted a lot of human capital. Not that like, yeah, I'll you probably- You can do it. Yeah, you can yeah. do that. And I'll probably re-walk it back a little bit that you need to focus on- yourself and investing in your career and your human capital because I think if you are waiting and waiting and waiting for that big break, if it doesn't come, we just need to hedge a bet. So, Mm. but then again, if you're making enough money and you like life, whatever. But I didn't want it to be like um, this struggling podcast trying to make it for like, we'd been doing it for five years. I'm like, if it's on, it's on and we're going to double down. Mm. If it's not, get the hell out of there. So, threw everything at it and then- after the 12 months, we reassessed and like, yep, yeah, the signs of life, let's double down. And then I commenced and sold my financial advice business because I wanted to do one-to-many finance stuff. Mm. And to be honest, I was sick of, I was bored. I mean, I had really good financial advice business. I had won a heap of awards in the industry. I was on the uh, board of one of the financial planning associations. There's two in Australia, two major Mm. associations. I was on the board of one of them. So, you know, I was at the peak of what I considered that world, Mm. Um, you know, at meetings in Parliament House with politicians or, you know, all that stuff. So, Mm. I just wanted to change. So, had a good business, was involved heavily in the industry met a lot of cool people. I was a bit bored of what I was doing and I wanted to transition 100% online. So, that's when I started to, well, the wheels in motion to sell the business. And then I was cashed up and it's really weird feeling not to have any money coming in the door and living off your savings Mm. um, because it was probably a couple of years before I started making real money from the podcast. And... Yeah, I, I'm just of the view that if I'm going to start a venture, I want to throw everything at it because if it fails, it's too late to say, oh, should have tried that. Yeah. Or like if you're on a sinking boat, you want to do as much as you can to get the water off the boat because if it's about to sink, you're like, oh, we should have checked the the bilge connection yeah. when the water started coming in. Like, So, I just wanted to throw everything at it um, and just see what happened. Do you think, like, so you're, it, just from that brief passage there, it seems like you're super entrepreneurial. Like, you just start things, doesn't work, move on. Mm. Um, do you think, what what do you think separates you then from people that kind of get paralyzed by the idea, like, they want to do it, but they don't? Well, I think the thing is, you know, my personality is shoot first, aim second. 
Yeah, right. And that's caused me a lot of drama in every area of my life. And I've kind of learned that that's a problem. Um, but, you know, entrepreneurship and, you know, not everyone's cut out to run their own business. And that's fine. If you're not, don't. But I kind of, when I talk about, you know, that entrepreneurship and, you know, the analysis paralysis and all that stuff, the biggest thing I see in business that, you know, I use the analogy of a baker. Like, you can be the best baker in the world, but you can't run a business. Yeah. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. or you can be the best business owner in the world, but if you don't know the fundamentals of how the baking works, it's mm-hmm. not going to be a good experience for the customer. So, I don't know. I think I don't have the I don't have the problem of analysis paralysis. It has caused me a lot of problems and it costs me a lot of money. But I think my method that I've used in my own life is the venture capital method. Throw heaps of money at a heap of different ideas. There's a percentage chance that mm. there might be something in there that's good. And then that good thing will make up all the money that you've lost. Mm. So, it is a bit on the risk spectrum. So, we talk about investing risk all the time, right? Mm. My risk profile um, for- starting my own business or having my own business or being self-employed is well mature. And I can understand, you know, at the start, it was t- start it was really hard to start my own business because I had no money. Mm. Everything was a big risk. But Sort Your Money Out or the podcast rather, um, My Millennial Money, it was easier because money wasn't an issue. But then I had to focus on the psychological side of, I'm burning capital here. Mm, yeah. <laughs> like, so everything's a everything in life is a risk spectrum. Now, if you are, if you do have an idea, the problem is you like if you are on that side of perfectionist analysis paralysis. Everyone's got like the best idea and all this stuff. Well, your idea sucks unless <laughs> you've told people and you can put it into motion, right? So, and that's really bad to hear. Mm, <laughs> like, yeah, it's, yeah. But, but it's the let's reality. be true. It's, it's not worth anything until we can see it and test it and see if the market needs it. So don't be too shy about keeping your secret idea and all that. Like just get it out there. Like lean into books about failing fast and all that. And I do the fail fast in my business today still. Like let's try it. If it doesn't work, be agile, pivot, ditch it, move on. Mm. But maybe what you can do, what I did when I started my first business, I just brain dumped like- what do I need to do to get this business off the ground and just set my timer for like two minutes and wrote as many things down, like build a website, get an ABN, um, get a logo design, register this, do that, you know, Mm. all this. And then what I did, I just went back on that list and every week or every day, depending on the size of the task, all I had to do is slowly tick things off. So make the mountain Mm. a pile of rocks. And just slowly eat that elephant. Yep. Like it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's so many ways we could go with that. How did you know that Sort Your Money Out, the podcast, because mm. there's Sort Your Money Out and Get Invested, the book, yep. which is, I would say, a huge success. Mm. But how did you know the podcast by that name wasn't working? Oh, uh, the strategy sucked and- Like viewership downloads. Were you measuring it in any way? No. So, basically, what you've got to do if you want to launch something into the market, whether it's a a, a new craft beer, whether it's a mm. clothing brand, whether it's a podcast or a whatever you want to do, I believe it's all about distribution. Yeah. Agreed. You know, there's so many money books everywhere. Like, everyone's got a friggin' book about money. Like, they're all the same. But, like, you can write the best money book in the world, but if you've got no channels to distribute it, to get it into the hands of people, it's not going to work. It's like musos, right? You can drive around the CBD here of Melbourne most Friday, Saturday nights. Musicians playing covers are probably better musicians than the covers that they're playing, Mm -hmm. but they just haven't been discovered and had distribution. So, there is a- there's actually a really good book I would encourage anyone to read. It's by a professor that we had on My Millennial Money, Robert Frank, and the book's called Success and Luck. And Mm. he's a professor from Cornell. Okay. 
And a lot of this stuff that we do with your investing, business, entrepreneur, it's a lot of it's luck, like success and luck. It's a two-edged um, coin. But I don't even know what I was saying. Um, I knew that Sort Your Money Out, the podcast, wasn't a success because I had two big issues. One, I had no incumbent distribution. Two, my strategy was to try and focus on the American market first. Right. Which is dumb because I'm not in that market. Aussie accent. Yeah. Well, I thought it could have been the point of difference. Oh, yeah. But I didn't have an incumbent distribution channel. And yeah, and I was, yeah, it was just different. I, what I was doing with the strategy was just interviewing a lot of other money people and it just wasn't right. And then when I, you know, My Millennial Money, the podcast, actually, I remember I was at my house in Blue Bay on the Central Coast, New South Wales, and I was having a shower one morning and My Millennial Money was a shower idea. Hmm. I'm like, I need to create more content online and be more consistent. Mm. I need a new brand and I need to do it differently. And then at the time, millennial was like the big word that everyone was using. Yeah. Like, oh, millennial money. Oh, my millennial money. Yeah, let's go with that. And then I created a little logo on an app and called John, who's still one of the co-hosts, said, hey, you want to do a podcast? He's like, yeah, all right. I'm like, sweet, we're doing it. So, but within that, to launch the podcast, and this is like, like my business, it's an investment asset. And that's why we can talk about business on an investing podcast mm. because you buy businesses with your share portfolio, right? Yeah. And that's all businesses. You want to make money, bricks and businesses, basically. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you don't even say the word shares because shares are businesses. Mm. Um, so, property and businesses. Mm. That's how you make money, right? Um, do you think, do you think the, um, one thing I wanted to talk to you mm. about was like the landscape. So, I think of like podcasts as kind of like the Netflix to TV like mm. the new radio, um, hence why all the radio stations push their podcasts. Mm. Do you think that we are early or do you the podcasting space is maturing? Like where do you think we are in that life cycle? I think it's pretty matured. Mm-hmm. I mean, I remember listening to podcasts commuting to my job in 2009. Yeah. Like they've been around, not many Australian ones. Mm. And that's why when I started there- I I don't think there were many I don't think there were many Aussie personal finance podcasts that were mainstream. No, I can't and, think and that's why I started it and I'm like there is just no mainstream Aussie money podcast for Aussies by Aussies. So I couldn't start my millennial money again. And that's why as an asset I need to really take care of it and do the best that I can because I know that I, it's kind of like the market must like it because it's still growing and mm. it's still, you know, mm. happening. But there is an element of luck. Mm. Yeah, agreed. And I, I, when I started, right like I did two main strategies when I started the show because when I started my financial planning business, and this is for anyone who's a business owner, like you can have the you can be the best at what you do, but how are you going to get clients? I spent the first year of my first business focusing on referral sources for people to send me clients because I had a rule: I'll never make a cold call. Hmm. I want to set my business up so the work comes to me. So, hmm. you know, I've met with forty centers of influence possible, like mortgage brokers, accountants, lawyers, bookkeepers, all these other businesses. We do financial advice, blah, blah, blah. Send me your clients. I'll look after them and keep you in the loop. And then, because you've got to make sure you've always got work, right? And so, yeah, I I kind of did the same thing with the podcast. Um, in the early days, the first year, because podcasts were so new and fun and cool, like I would say to guests, I'm like, you can come on my podcast, but mm. what you need to do you need to commit to spend $300 on advertising the episode that you're on, on your social media. Ah, Because you're a boring lawyer (laughs) and people in your feed would like to see interesting things. So yeah, that's one way that I distributed because everything's about distribution. How do you get the word out there? Yeah. I 
one of the things was like, you can come on my podcast, podcast, no cost, but there is a cost. You've got to pay to promote it on your own channels. And then in the first year, because I was cashed up and experimenting, and I think I still maintain it was the worst money I've ever spent, but also it kind of worked, so all good. Mm. I spent $60,000 on Instagram ads in the first 12 months. Oh, wow. So I, I just like, this is, the market needs an Aussie money podcast. I think, you know, and the first episode, they were crap. But you just got to start and get better. I need to build the audience as fast as possible. So the only money I've ever spent was in that first year on Instagram ads. Hmm. If you were, say, if you're starting something similar today, would you be using Instagram for something like this? Or would you, I mean, is there something new like uh, TikTok, YouTube? Is there something else? I don't, I don't know. Um, I know one thing, if you're listening to this podcast on Spotify or Apple, you consume your podcast by audio. So mm. that's why we've stopped our YouTube strategy because yeah. our podcast people are podcast listeners. And the same thing, like you might blow up on TikTok or Instagram reels or any of that stuff, but trying to convert yeah. those to another medium, good luck. And I know Spotify, they've plucked a few um, influencers out of the water given them a podcast mm. and tried to, and I think it's obviously happening because they still exist, but it's really hard. I don't know how. You've just got to do good content and be consistent. That's what I would say. Mm. If it's good and you're consistent, people will share it. Like I'm in podcast groups in like from conferences in America and there's people like, oh, how do I grow my podcast? Well, number one, be consistent. Number two, make sure your content's good. Number three, get into the meat of the discussion within the first two minutes, three minutes. If it's good, people will share it. Mm. Yeah. That's the only formula I can say. If you, unless you've been on, I don't even know, I don't even watch TV. Like, remember, like, do they still do Big Brother or? Yeah, like a, or no, I don't know. But I, yeah, or like maths. maths or, yeah, if you're on maths and you've got a bit of a profile. Sure, you've got a bit of an incumbent audience to distribute your mm. podcast or YouTube channel. Mm. But yeah, I don't know. I don't think, for what it's worth, I don't think the audiences traverse very well to podcasts. Like, I don't think the the social, I think it's good. Like, I think it's important, mm. but I don't think it's the only way because it's that transition from that social short form to long form is quite a difficult one. Yeah. Yeah. So, I all I would say to anyone who wants to do a podcast or YouTube, I'd probably say double down on YouTube, to be honest, but I don't like it because you got to look good for camera. <laughs> like, <laughs> make sure I'm shaved or like- So, yeah. you just employ people to do it. Yeah, all that model. But then again, you step into the business side, you're employing talent. Yeah. Are you employing talent or contracting talent? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. I don't employ talent. Yeah. I contract them. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. Good distinction too, Yeah, I think. Um, okay, so- Maybe just to round out this conversation of like the, the media business. I call it media business, not that. It's like finance and education and literacy mm. and everything, investing literacy, mm. careers now with the new book. Mm. Um, if you think about it, where you were then spending that $60,000 to where you are now, mm. would that version of Glenn say that's a sh huge success you've done so well? Would you, be, would you take pride in that? I think so. Um, I mean, now like- if I'm not making 60 grand a month, there's a problem. Yeah, right. Like, so it was a lot of money back when I started because mm. remember, I, I had no money coming in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> spending $1,000 a week on advertising or whatever. Like, um, yeah, I I think I'm, I don't know. I'd say it, you are from the outside. Yeah. I'd say it's a success. Yeah, it is. And I mean, like last year, enough. the- operating entity like Simo Interactive, we were the 34th fastest growing company in Australia um, mm. with the AFR fast starters. And that's like, that was wow. Yeah. Um, and I only really did that and submitted that because no one cares or knows about the brand Simo. Like, mm. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'll just see what, how I'm going against um, the rest of the market. Um, cool. So, yeah, I think it- it's a success because we're still here and we're still doing it, but I don't ever want to, um, and I've said this to my team, like we can't ever take advantage of what we've got. 
Like mm. people that listen to our content and engage with us, like they're the most important thing. And that's why we turn away more brands that want to freaking promote credit cards to my audience and personal lines like, nah, don't need your money. Yeah. And that was a distinction as well. Like starting our podcast, I didn't need to sell out yeah. to brands or to get ads because money wasn't my problem. I had lots of money, mm. but I wanted to um, build it based on the community and the content. And from the first year, we've done an annual census every year because you need to know who you're speaking to, what they want. And yep. now we just do use generated content. And by that, you mean like people submit questions, yeah. you answer them, it's fun, yep. it's valuable, it's practical. Yep. Yeah. Um, I think that's yeah, a really valuable point there around you didn't need to sell out early on. I think a lot of people that start with a content business or some sort of like um, content marketing strategy, they tend to focus on the bottom of the funnel first. Mm. Like, what am I going to get out of this? Not the, you know, give, 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 take. It's the take first. Well, and that's the best thing. Like, if you want to start an online content business, it's the ultimate side hustle because mm. you can do it after hours. Where when I started my financial planning business, I couldn't do it on the site because you need to be an authorized representative, aka have a license, be a licensed advisor. Yeah. I couldn't be working for a firm and having my own license on the site. Yeah. So I had to jump 100%. Yeah. Um, I think like I have all the links in the show notes to everything, including the new book and existing book. You should order. I've just ordered some. I'm going to give some away, so keep Thank an eye you. on social media. Thank you. Um, but I'd like to transition a bit to something that you said, um, and you were so generous in donating heaps of these books mm. uh, to our event that we did in Melbourne in late in 2022. Um, and there was a question from the audience which was fantastic. It was, I think it was something to the effect of if you could go back and change mm. something um, or what do you wish you knew when you were 18? Yeah. And your answer to it was something to the effect of, I wish I had a better appreciation, a better understanding of mental health. Mm. Now, I want to touch on this because we've I've spoken a bit about this recently. Um, like I've been seeing a psych for like about 18 months. Uh, I've got a and now I've got a coach as well for yeah, the business cool. and for myself, yeah. which I just wish I knew this earlier. Like I'm 32 now. Mm. I wish I was doing that when I was 22. Mm. And I just think the most profound effect it's had on the way I invest, the way I run my life, the way I run the business, how much money I save, what I spend money on. And I already kind of knew this because I was a huge fan of Morgan Household. So from the outside, I'm like, this guy, it just make, it makes so much sense. It's more to do with who you are. And just trying to be reasonable. Mm. And I realized like I just needed to rearrange so much. Mm. And when you said that, it really struck a chord with me. And I didn't know who else like was in this same boat, like in our industry, who would be willing to talk about this stuff. Mm. So maybe can you just talk a little bit about your journey in that respect? And maybe Glenn now versus uh, Glenn now versus Glenn then. Mm. And let's just riff on that. Yeah. So when I was 18, 19, 20, into my 20s, like even 25, 26, 27, I, looking back, I was so, so depressed and so, so anxious. And even looking back at my childhood, I know I had childhood anxiety, whether it was going away for like um, cub camps or scouts or whatever, I did that, mm -hmm. staying in other people's homes overnight, just had this anxiety. And I just look back now and go, that's what it was. Mm. And going into my late teens, um, there would be days where you just so, so, it's not even, if you've had depression, you know, it's not even sadness. It's this, there's no hope. That's what it is. It's, mm. there's no, it's just the darkest of, it's, you, I don't know how to explain it. It's just mm. you're in a hopeless space. And so, yeah, so I was like for years just it would come like I'd have waves of depression and anxiety. Usually they're not together, yeah. um, one or the other. And, yeah, it was just like this. I'm just like, this is so weird. How do people just, if this is what life is, yeah, <laughs> like, I don't know, people must just, but then- yeah, it, it, it got to a tipping point where I was like, I was in a bad space and it got to the point where I would have like physical almost, I remember twice I had like a bit panic attacks. Yep. Like I was just like short of breath 
was like, this is weird. And because I had another business um, that I did with someone else in Sydney at the time and I was not in a good space. Like, yeah, it was wild. And I went to my doctor. I was like, oh, I, I need – I actually took the day off because I was – there was, I think, five days running where I couldn't get out of bed. Hmm. Like, <laughs> yeah, right. rock bottom. And um, I went to see my doctor. And seeing the doctor, it was like, oh, this is so weird. Like, am I going to say, oh, I'm not feeling that good. I I think I've been a bit sad or down. Or, and I honestly thought that he was going to press the big buzzer, the big bell. And be like, all right, everyone, we've got our first case of depression in Australia. Come on in, everyone. Hmm. And like this. And so, that's why I didn't. Well, I didn't know that people didn't feel that this wasn't how you're supposed to feel. Yeah. I just thought that's every human. I was bad moods most days. Um, just wasn't great. Like when I travel overseas, severe, severe homesickness and anxiety when I traveled, like horrendous anxiety. And um, yeah, he's like, oh, sounds like you've got a bit of depression. Just as a like, mm-hmm. it's all right. It's, it's like you've got high cholesterol or something. Or Yeah. And so, he got me into a psychologist and I started some talk therapy and, yeah, just started that journey and ended up being medicated and now life's great. Mm. Like, I honestly, you know, and I always, you know, you always have bad days. Like, you're not going to get rid of that. But someone said to me once, having the medication, what it does, it gives you a bit of a life jacket. So, most people, if you're- functioning with the right levels of serotonin or whatever in your brain, most people glide along life at a six out of 10. So, if there's a bit of a a hard day or a whatever, they might dip down to like a three or four. Mm. But my baseline serotonin might be a three out of 10. So, if I dip, it's at zero or below. Yep. So, all it does is just helps you. Um, But I travel now- I don't have to, when I travel overseas or travel, um, I don't have to wear earplugs to get to sleep. I get to sleep easy now. That was a big symptom for me. Hmm. Couldn't get to sleep. Um, had really bad sleep. Um, digestive problems um, was horrendous. That's cleared up. Sleep's cleared up. I'm not in a bad mood most of the time now. Um, I'm happy. And it was funny, like, I've never had- um, thoughts of taking my own life, like serious thoughts. But I remember going to a cafe one day. I used to go to this cafe every day for breakfast and I walk in. The lady was like, oh, how are you going today? It's like, yeah, all right, just hanging around, waiting to die, nothing else to do. Like, because <laughs> I'd had no hope. I was hopeless. Mm. Um, and, yeah, so I'm great. And I'll just encourage anyone, if you if you feel like you're always in a bit of a bad mood or a bit sad or feeling unsettled, because I didn't know what that was then. Mm. But I look back now and I'm like, far out. I could have, man, if I was medicated in my early 20s, <laughs> I would have had a bigger company sooner. Like, I would have been functioning, flying on all cylinders. Like, it was just so bad. Like, in mm. my 20s, it was such a train wreck. Couldn't hold down relationships because if you're empty, you can't give. Starting mm. my business, the amount of anxiety that that would have, not having money coming in. I, yeah, I'll just encourage anyone to speak to your GP. Mm. Yeah, I, absolutely. Um, what I would, and I, thank you for sharing that, by the way. That's all right. Um, what my my story, my journey was a little bit different, mm-hmm. and I think everyone's is. Um, but I, I think it started like obviously a lot of like childhood and early adult stuff. But then, what was really interesting is, I I remember one year, it was a few years ago, maybe two or three years. It was the first day back at work for the entire team. Mm. And I jumped on the call, like the team, first day back, January, I think it was like January 14th, a few years ago, jumped on the call and I had this incredible headache. It was like a migraine like you wouldn't believe. It actually put me down on the ground. I was watering the garden at 7 a.m. By 8.30, I was, the ambulance was there. Wow. Um, and we were like, uh, I was trying to welcome team members like remotely mm. and onto the call and- um, just couldn't handle it. Ended up in hospital. Like I was um, 
like injected, like given a something or other, and it knocked me out for like three or four days. God. And I would, I had no idea about all this sort of stuff. I didn't realize how much anxiety I was carrying on with the mm. business mm. because over Christmas you think it's time off, you can have your time, but when you run a business, it's not. It's, you don't. It's very difficult to switch mm. off. Anyway, I that like that was only the first of what later became like a bigger problem. And I just kept on running myself into the ground. And I talked to a lot of investors on the show about this and particularly those in VC, which is that when, you, when you're in this world, um, typically it's an imbalance that causes a lot of entrepreneurship. Mm. So it's the imbalance that causes, in my case, a lot of anxiety around money led to me starting a money business mm. and an investing business, something that I never had any exposure to, but I felt like I had to through that anxiety. Mm. And that's what resulted in all of this. It, and a lot of decisions throughout my career and blah, blah, blah. The list goes on. Now, what my another distinction, I guess, between the two of us is when I got medicated, I couldn't handle it. Right. Yeah, I tried it for as long as I could stick it out and I just couldn't handle it. So then I went back the other way and it's just 100% talk therapy now, which is just a game changer for me. Yeah, I think, and that's important to note, like there was a stage because over those, you know, years in my 20s, it did flow depression, anxiety, like a wave. Mm. One of the stages when I did start the talk therapy, when I started this journey, was, um, and you can look it up or speak to your doctor, they call it reactive depression. Mm. So, it's caused by a situation in your life. So, it could be a relationship uh, breakdown, could be a bad business relationship. So, you're reacting to that situation. And my doctor said to me, he goes, and I told him about the business. He's like, oh, sounds like you've got some misaligned goals there. <laughs> like the GP said that to me. Yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> you're bloody right. And within the week, I'd made the call and like, I'm out. Hmm. And instantly, the depression at that time left. Yeah, right. So, but I've resolved, I, I am medicated and I still have my little effects or tablets. And it's not a lot, 75 milligram a day. It's just kind of a floating, just enough. And I did try and, because I've been so great and solid and- um a couple of years ago, two years ago at Christmas, I think, I tried to come off it just to see, you know, business was good, everything was good. Um, I came down off it for like six weeks because uh, it's a really slow process to get yeah, off it. Is. Yeah, a lot of people don't realise that. And I was, oh, it's just like, I, this is, I literally had flashbacks to how the Glenn was in his 20s, how I felt. Hmm. So, I'm like, I'm- happy to go to the grave with this medication. Hmm. Fair enough. Yeah. And then uh, there will be different seasons. Like I, I was seeing a um, psychologist just before COVID because I had a, in my mind, I had this thought process that kept going around and around. And I was like, oh, if that goes to that, then that goes to that, then it goes to that, and then it just kept going. And I'm like, I just need to go and talk with someone, pack, unpack everything on the table mm. and just help get someone to- unpack a thought process that I was having about an issue. So, I think talk therapy is good. Yep. And I would like of I would like to have not had the medication route obviously, but I've just resolved it's part of my daily routine now. Just, That's great. And it's great that you can talk mm. about it. I think it's wonderful. So, yeah. great stuff. So, yeah. See uh, your GP if something's not right everyone. Yep. Agreed. Um and a lot of people stick their head in the sand. A lot of, I I'm going to uh, generalize here and talk about like the males in particular mm. young males. And this is where this would be quite interesting, I think, for a lot of our listeners, which is that that point where that impacts money. Mm. Like we look at the psychology of money, uh, mind over money here from Evan Lucas. Many of the books now, behavioral economics is this rapidly emerging field. Mm. Were there any, could you have studied your budget at the time to see if something was misaligned. So, your GP said, this is misaligned goals here. Could you have seen something? Because you said you're a spender, right? Yeah, I'm a spender. Do you reckon that has come from anything? Like a uh, imposter syndrome? No, I, like I just that? think I like spending money. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Like, I I still maintain I'm crap at saving money, but I've made <laughs> sure I'm a good investor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I don't carry that much cash above, you know, my emergency fund, some operating expenses in the business. Like, all, like anything above what I need to live just gets invested mm. or I blow money. Like my later, oh, I probably shouldn't say it publicly, but my latest blow was like I bought one of those sim rigs. What's that? Like you 
drive eraser thing and oh, got three yeah. screens and, yeah. you know, it was probably a bit impulsive. So, but I did it over a long period of time. So, I'm convinced that it wasn't impulsive, but that's kind of the biggest blowout that I've had. But I just wanted to try something different um, and try and have a bit of a hobby. But what I've, um, what I've said was like, in my life with my spending now, I know as a spender, I will have blowouts each week, each month. Mm -hmm. The key is to make sure it's a hundred dollar blowout, not a thousand dollar blowout. And that's why my spending plan will help me not have those big blowouts. Mm. See, I, I, I see a lot of people say like, so people with like vices, like addictions mm -hmm. um, and mental health can often lead to people unable to s stick with jobs or have intentional habits with money. That was a big one for me. I didn't have any intention mm. with money. I could save, but it's more through self-deprecation. Yeah. So, what I, um, I've just done a podcast on my millennial money about mm. what I wish I knew about money in my 20s. Mm. I've distilled it to three things that the, the advice that I give to people in their 20s about money. Mm -hmm. Number one, no consumer debt. Cash flow your life. Yep. Just make sure if you each week you've got a dollar left in your bank account, you're killing it. Mm -hmm. If you're not saving money, you're surviving, you're not going into debt, you're killing it. Number one, no consumer debt at all. Mm -hmm. Number two, have a lean and agile budget or cash flow system. Be a small startup as you you are in your 20s. Mm. You want to make sure you don't have payments tying you down. You want to make sure you don't have heaps of subscriptions tying you down. You want to make sure you don't have heaps of commitments tying you down because if an opportunity comes up, you need to be agile in your cash flow and budget to take that opportunity. Number three is to have clear goals and be intentional. Mm. Be intentional. Okay, and you might say, well, Glenn... You don't know. I don't know what I want to do in my 20s. That's fine, but you can still live with intention. I'm intentional that I need to save money. I'm intentional that I need to experience life. I'm intentional that I need to still have fun. Mm. We're doing all these things with intentional. So, no consumer debt. Have a lean cash flow system. Have fun. Have experiences. Have all that stuff, but don't do it with debt and have a good system to manage your money to make sure it's lean and agile and have goals. Whether it is just, I just need to save $5,000. I've got no goals at the moment. I don't know what I'm going to do with my career mm. at the moment. I'm just going to save and be cash heavy because then I've got the opportunity to pull the trigger on something if it does arrive. And people might say, oh, shouldn't you tell people to buy a house or invest in their 20s? I think if they're meeting those, those three things of being intentional, not having debt and having a... A, a budget that is um, agile, they can do whatever they want. Mm. I think it's important. Yeah. So, I just think that focus and attention with no debt in your 20s, mm. that's the best thing that you can do with money. Mm. I spoke about this similar thing. I think that's great. At least the three. I spoke about a similar thing on our other series, our other podcast channel recently about the idea of a vision board and mm. just how to construct one, yep. which is one of the first things you might do if you see a coach or something like that. Like, okay, they, they ask you, well, what do you like? Mm. You're like, oh, I don't know, fishing, outdoors, mm. fresh air, like really simple stuff. Just write them down. And the other side, what don't you like? And it's often the counterpoints to the things you do like. And then from that, you've got your dislikes and your likes. Well, what? how can you do more of that? Like what's something you could do? Well, I want to go on camping trips. I want to do... You know, I want to get a job in the city because I want to be amongst the hustle and bustle. That's what I like, whatever. Mm. And then you work back and then you're like, okay, well, here's a, a kind of a framework for kind of how I want to live my life and what I want to focus on. Mm. Then you've got maybe goals start to f f trickle through from that. And that process, people think, well, you could do that sitting down, you know, s s speak with someone. It probably took me three to six months. Yeah. You know, just going back to it every few weeks. Yeah. Like this, don't like that. Oh, I realize I like this, doing this thing. I should do more of that. And from that, then I could, you know how we do the whole... If you're a financial advisor, you go, well, what are your goals? You're short, medium, long term. Then mm. you can start to go, well, this one's important to me. And once you know them, you can orient yourself towards that. Yeah. And I mean, that's all about having a values-based exactly. spending plan or budget, right? Yeah. Like, why are you doing things that you don't value? Yeah. But people don't take the time to just even put that down. Yeah, totally. Just even a list of things that I like doing. 
And we often find like there's the great activity, which is like just have like three columns or two columns. What are you spending money on in order? What brings mm. you the most happiness? Mm. And then what are you spending the most time on? Draw a line between them, see where there's massive, you know, mismatch. Yeah. Really yeah, and steps. I think like I like people like, oh, I'd rather just invest. I'm like, awesome, got to be investing for the future. But you've mm. got to be enjoying the now as well. Yeah, which is what your three points are all about. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think if you ask anyone in their, who's out of their 20s, what do you wish you knew? Well, just go and have fun. Mm. But also be it, do it sensibly. Like, yeah. Do it within bumper bars, yeah. so to speak. Just don't have any consumer debt. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. most of you that have consumer debt, and I've had consumer debt before, if you could unscramble that egg, would you like to? Yeah. A lot of people would go, yes. Mm. Yeah. Cause and effect. <laughs> yeah. So we're talking about credit cards, uh, buy now, pay later, personal loans, those types of things. Yep. Get rid of them. Um, and you can live without it, which is really important. Mm. Um, I, I guess there, there are many other things I want to talk to you about. How do you invest today? Well, I do it very simply. I've got three main investments, mm. my business, mm -hmm. properties, mm -hmm. and shares. And I say shares as in I've got a superannuation account and I've got a um, an investment account in my family trust. Mm -hmm. I've also got a- um, Oh, what are they called? The bonds. Whatever. Insurance bond. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A, um, a Gen Life insurance bond that I invest in. Yeah, um, right. So, I keep my investing automated in my super is because I'm an employee of my company. So, mm -hmm. I get my SG every yeah. month. That's invested. That's all good. Um, my investment account that is in my family trust, I think there's like a float- in the cash hub and I've just automatic every Wednesday um, shares get purchased, ETFs get put, purchased, broad-based ETF. So I just, yeah, mm. every every week I'm buying. Um, and then every month I have money that's coming out of my um, spending plan uh, that goes into the investment bond. Yep. Um, the reason that's coming out of my spending plan is because I'm investing because I still need to invest out of my personal income. Yep. But the money that's in the trust is usually business profits, which can be a bit lumpy. Yeah. Um, and that's why I am cash heavy in the investing platform in the cash count and then just set up automatic. So, I still remove me. Mm -hmm. If- um, Why do you remove you? Because- human behavior is bad. <laughs> like I'll, I'll always want to try and time the market. But yeah. then again, like, so I invest weekly in the trust, monthly in the um, investment bond and quarterly with super, right? Because they yeah. probably place the trades quarterly um, in that portfolio. Um, but because I am cash heavy, if there is an opportunity- if the market shats its pants for a week or something like that, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll flick some cash over and just mm. steal a bit then. But in the main, or if someone's like, oh, I, like uh, over the years, I've had opportunities come up like, oh, do you want to invest in this um, pre-IPO thing or this um, startup or something? I've always got cash to take advantage of that. Mm. Um, but in the main, investing, it's pretty boring and- my investment properties, I even pay down principal and interest on my investment properties as well. Um, do you, on that, we don't talk m as much about this as we probably mm. should. Do you segregate what goes into shares versus property like in, in any way? Nah, not really. Yeah, right. So, they're not discrete. They're just got like- They're all under one big strategy. Do you- do, So, it, okay. Do you want me to tell you my investment strategy? Yeah, tell For me. my life. Yeah, go for it. If you're willing. Yeah. I'll try and remember. I haven't remembered these point forms for a while. Number one, mm -hmm. um, live on less than I earn. Mm -hmm. Number two, be a generous giver. Yep. I love that. Yeah. Number three, um, invest the rest. Hmm. Simple. What's the problem? Yeah. Give, save, spend. Yep. That's all I do. I don't get stuck in the weeds about PE ratios and all this. Broad market ETFs, 
S and P five hundred, ASX two hundred, some international exposure. Opportunity comes up. Hey, Glenn, want to flick some money into this? You know, pre IPO convertible note. Yeah, I've got the cash. Sure, I'll take the risk. Yeah. If the money doesn't, like, I'm not putting any of those specky stuff. I don't do more than ten percent of my overall portfolio because if you get flushed, you don't want to flush you. But if there's upside, you probably get 200 percent return. Mm. An IPO I did once. It's like 750% return, which is awesome. I'll take that within two weeks when it floats. Hmm. But if I put my house on it and didn't go anywhere, well, you lose your ass. Mm. Do you think that over the long term, you will liquidate more of your portfolio, your property portfolio? No, never sell property. That's my rule. Yeah, right. And that's P and I pay it down. So basically- So you use an equity to then roll the next one? Uh, yes, I am, but- I'm talking at the moment, um, my next property, I'm probably going to put cash into it. Oh, right. Okay. Now, everyone's going to be thinking, what the hell? You're a dickhead. Why would you do <laughs> that? Go and read the psychology of the money book yeah. or whatever. Yeah. It's a money decision, not a financial decision. I don't. I want to um, de-risk a little bit and use a different bank hmm. and- Actually, my next property is going to be a home anyway, so I'm obviously going to put cash into it because I'm going to live in it. So, you don't want yep. to use equity to buy your principal place of residence. But um, but I will be doing it with a separate bank. Yeah. Mm. So, I've got two banks at the moment and, yeah, because I just don't want all my money with the one banking institution because if a policy changes and they want to call in a loan or if there's a, s- a crunch or a squeeze or whatever, yep. I just need to de-risk a little bit. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Eggs in one basket, same thing with lending, I think. Yeah. When uh, I listened to an interview that you did with Aussie Firebug uh, ages ago, Mm -hmm. you talked about having, like, when you're a younger person, well, pretty much anyone really on this Mm. journey at the kind of inception stage, is you need to get a bigger shovel. Mm. You know, talking about, and that refers to income, Mm. you know, maximize that so you can throw as much away as you can. Can you talk to us about, maybe with the new book, yeah. Sort Your Career Out, co-authored, mm. can you talk to us about maybe some of the strategies you might advocate for 20s and 30-year-olds that listen to the show? Yeah. So, I'm a big believer that, you know, particularly if you've got an investment portfolio of 100 grand or less, the biggest percentage-based return that you can grow that portfolio by is your own human capital. Hmm. Your own human capital is when you go out to work, exchange your human capital, you, your time for money. And then, so if you put $5,000 into a $100,000 portfolio, basically an instant 5% return, right? Hmm. So, if you think if you had a portfolio of $50,000, hmm. you know- 10%. 10%. 10%. Like, it's just, you do the maths on that. So, the best way to grow your wealth- in the starting stages is to transfer as much of your human capital as possible because you are a walking annuity yep. and you want to look after your annuity. So, in the book, Sort Your Career Out and Make More Money, I really focused in the- So, I co-authored it with Shell Johnson, who's the host of the My Millennial Career podcast. She covers a lot of the work stuff like strengths, skills, yep. resumes- all those tough value things and the mm. hard conversations where I wanted to really focus on making more money. And I I wrote two chapters on mindset. Mm-hmm. Um, we wrote a big chapter on risk because risk plays a big part of that. And my chapter on make more money, I talk about there's four ways to make more money in your career above award-based roles or on top of market forces. So, for market forces, just an example, I went and got my beard done and my head shaved in Melbourne the other day. Almost had a stroke. Yeah, thank you. (laughs) Almost had a stroke. Uh, It was like $75. Mm. I'm like, what the bloody- Anyway. (laughs) So, the barber, that's like at the top what you can charge for a year beard and hair, right? Yeah. They can't turn around tomorrow and say it's now $300 because I would lose customers. Yeah. Like I'm not paying $300. So, 
$75, last minute, yeah, you're really good, talented. So they've increased their price at the top of um, probably that band for that product. So for them to make more money, well, what do you do? You got to put another barber on and own the business and all that stuff, right? So you get this market forces thing. Yep. Now, it's easy for the barber next door who might only be charging $50. Well, if they want to make more money, next door's charging $75. We'll just increase it to $70. Be a little bit cheaper and still make- Anyway, so the four main ways to make money above market forces or above award-based roles. Now, and you might say, I can't do these things, Glenn, because I'm a nurse and I'm on a pay band. I'm a teacher and I'm on pay band. I'm like, "Uh aha, it's not- a job discussion now, it's a career discussion for you. Mm. So I'll just plant that seed. But the four main ways to make unlimited upside is to one, uh, be a manager of people and processes. So Mm -hmm. you might manage a team, you might manage a process. So Rach, um, our head of audio and production, she manages the process of uploading all the podcasts and manages all the editing stuff. She's not the editor, but she's the manager, okay? Mm -hmm. The second way to make more money is to be in sales. Hmm. So you're basically selling in sales, unlimited upside. Hustle. Hustle, sell more stuff, get bonus, all good. Third way, to be a specialist. Can you be that specialist web programmer or something like that? Some weird script that no one's heard of and Hmm. you're the person to do that. On the hairdressing thing, back to that, what if the barber I went to just specialised in beards and was known as the beard person? Mm. They could probably then charge $110. Mm. The fourth way is to be a business owner. So you own the business. And in the book, you know, there's a bit of a risk spectrum where all these fit in, in terms of taking risks and also the people component. Because if you hate people, well, managing might not be your thing. If you don't like risk, well, maybe starting a business or sales might not be your thing. And then you can start to blend those four things in the advanced income quadrant. Where so for me, I blended all four in my business. I'm a business owner, mm. specialist, like people come to me for comment on personal finance issues in Australia. So well known for that, mm. you know, in mainstream media. Um. I'm a manager of people and processes, so I've got a team of people that work for me, mm-hmm. um, and we sell ads for the products. Mm. So, yeah, all four. Yep. But you might be a physio. Can you own a business and manage other physios? Mm. Have two of the layers. Can yep. you be a BDM for a national company? So you manage your team, but you're also in sales. Yeah. So I think everyone's career- is their biggest financial asset. For sure. Because you will make millions of dollars over the course of your life. So particularly if you are in your young younger years, you need to don't worry about and I would say this like sort your career out and make more money. I've been marketing it as the prequel to sort your money out and get invested. Hmm. Cuz forget investing, forget, you know, wanting to take over the world and do all that stuff. No, focus on you, your career, because that's how you can make more money overnight. Mm. And this will even give you tools to have the pay discussion. If you're in a smaller business and there's not regular meetings, come up for air, have a chat with your leader and be like, hey, can we chat about pay? And we'll give you the, the scripts, the method, the formula to start to have those pay discussions. Because mm. what if you can get a five or 10 grand pay rise overnight? Yeah. You got to read the room. Like if your business was shut down during COVID and now we're just finally getting on top of things, well, maybe wait a minute. But like, yeah, I just, everyone has a career. Mm. And the the book will help you work out if you don't like your job, but you like the career in the industry. So, okay, stay in the same career, just change employers, change roles. Or, you know what? I don't actually like this career. I'm going to change industries completely. Mm. So, the big distinction that we need to know is you've got a job within your career. 
yeah. and you might not like either, the key killer would be to like both. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a great tool for anyone who wants to increase their income. And we've had even Shell, our co-author, she sent a copy of the book to a couple of people before it's been released, right? Because it's released just now. And they had got pay rises <laughs> from following. Oh, really? So, yeah, just- Proof is in the footing. Yeah. So, it's the prequel. And, mm. you know, for a couple of bucks, why not invest in- that annuity that's in your mirror every day. Mm. Because that also leads to, if you swing back to that mental health discussion, you could be really down, sad, not functioning 100% because you're not suited for what you're doing. Mm. Like at the start of the book, we talk about values and what your values are. So, it'll help you find your values. Like if you value trust and integrity- and you're working in a den of thieves and liars every day, how's that going to work out for you? Yeah. Not great. You've got to get out of there. You've got to change your co- your job because you like your career. Mm. Okay, just a change of job. You know, it's not changing because it's been that way forever. So, yeah, you will be able to set up your life your way because I've talked about loot, like life on own terms. Mm. Like just live your life on your own terms. And a lot of people will have a go at you because they'll say, oh, you shouldn't do this or you should do that. Mm. Like a lot of my business decisions that I make, they make no sense to a lot of people. That's fine. It's my business. My name's on the wall. Mm. I'll do it my way. My yeah. business is, you know, and we haven't talked about it, but it's like probably m- my prime wealth creational vehicle investment. And sure. th- that's why I'm like looking at diversifying within the business and other business stuff. But I do it my way because mm. I want to and I'm not apologizing for that. Mm. I think it's great. Uh, if you do want to grab a copy of the book, you can grab one for yourself um, or you can buy one for your nieces, nephews, your kids, your partner, whoever. Mm. Um, you know, sort your money out and get invested. Glenn's first book. For those watching, I'll hold it up onto the camera right here. Next one's yellow. Check them both out and gift them. It's yeah. a fantastic thing to do. Yeah. So, mate, yeah, I mean, we could talk for days. I know you're a busy fellow here in Melbourne. I uh, hope we can follow up with another one one day. But um, anyone that wants to check out My Millennial Money, there'll be a link in the show notes. Go and listen to Glenn. It's some of the most engaging podcast you'll ever hear because it's from the community every week not as refined as your stuff though but oh, i don't know about that but it's just fun <laughs> fun yeah, well so- uh, you said those three words at the start like every time i pick up a microphone it needs to be practical valuable and fun i always need to do two of those things mm. when i have a microphone yep well this was all three of them so oh, cool i appreciate it mate no um, worries. i really appreciate you taking the time sharing so much of your story and just yeah coming in having a chat in the studio love it thanks for your support see you guys Thanks for listening to the Australian Investors Podcast, which is proudly supported by JP Morgan Asset Management. JP Morgan Asset Management provides opportunities to strengthen and diversify investment portfolios through alternative income strategies with the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF, or ASX JEPI, J-E-P-I, currently the world's largest active ETF with assets under management of US $25.49 billion dollars as at the 16th of May, 2023. For more information, you can visit the JP Morgan Asset Management website by visiting am.jpmorgan.com slash au. That's am.jpmorgan.com slash au.